Hello, everybody. Welcome to not a Wednesday video. It is, in fact, Tuesday, but at least by the time you're listening to this, hopefully. And it is Tuesday, December the 7th, 2021, which makes it 80 years since the attack on Pearl Harbor. Hence why we're, well, we're not just doing a video this week on a Tuesday. You will get your regular video on a Wednesday as well. But, you know, 80th anniversaries don't come around that often. So, we're going to be talking about Pearl Harbor, but let's face it, there are probably a million and one videos already on YouTube talking about Pearl Harbor, how it happened, what happened, things that blew up, things that didn't blow up, etc. So rather than, you know, be one million and two video, <laughs> we thought we'd do things something a little bit differently. So as you can probably guess, there I have a special guest with me. So we're going to go through the history of Pearl Harbor, what happened on the day, but also the run up to it, why Pearl Harbor happened in the first place. But we're going to be doing it partly through the medium of you know history as things actually occurred, but also through the eyes of somebody who was actually there and what they experienced on that day. So with no further ado, I will pass you over to a special guest to introduce himself and tell him why he's here, because um, he is not in, does not look anywhere near old enough to have been at Pearl Harbor himself. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment, Jack. My name is William Cobb, and I am the founder of the Pensacola Aerospace Museum, which is a passion project I've undertaken. But it has a variety of ways how it came about. And one of the ways it came about is that my grandfather, was. Colonel William Ballinger Cobb, United States Army, was at Hickam Field on December 7th. And his position in all this is rather unique. And as I discovered his archive, because he kept a photo album with a lot of information, I discovered some material that really made me, as a lifelong student of the Pacific War, realize that this could potentially change history. So just a brief background about myself. I was born in Hawaii. I'm a second generation person born in Hawaii and we refer to that in the islands as a Kama'aina. My father was born in Hawaii almost a year after Pearl Harbor. And my grandfather, he did not live in Hawaii until November of 1941. He was a small town lawyer in Casper, Wyoming. And he received orders reactivating him for duty in the Hawaiian department in late September of 1941. Now, Grandpa was a World War I veteran. He was actually an artillery officer in the United States Army and went over there. And when I was a child, he used to tell me all his stories and I still remember him sitting me on his knee and telling me all about how once upon a time as an artillery officer, he was up in a balloon and some German aircraft came down and shot down the balloon. And grandpa turned over to the balloon pilot, since he was an artillery officer, he wasn't a balloonist. And he asked the man how to use the parachute because balloons back then were some of the only craft in allied service that had parachutes. He said he looked up, saw the fireball, looked over to ask the observer or the balloon operator and the guy was gone. So grandpa jumped and I'm here today to tell the story. So at any rate, grandpa was stationed in Hawaii from November of 1941. And he brought my grandmother with him. And his job was actually a legal officer, given that he was a lawyer, in the headquarters Hawaiian department. So in the lead up to December 7th, the night before the war began, Grandpa was actually at a conference at Scopio Barracks which is still one of the largest military bases in Hawaii. And Grandpa was at this conference concerning food supply in the Hawaiian Islands in case of war. So among the many materials I have, I have the minutes of that meeting where they're discussing what to do in case Hawaii is hit by the Japanese. And they talk about declaring martial law and organizing resources. And there's a very interesting logistical account about how 75% of the food in the Hawaiian Islands actually comes from the mainland. So this would create major problems. Anyway, grandpa, he and my grandmother ended up meeting an officer and his sister who the officer was stationed at Hickam Field. So 
They ended up going to the quarters of that officer and his sister at Hickam Field. They spent the night and the next morning they woke up to December 7, 1941. Now, in order to set his material in context, I really wanna talk both about the strategic level and the, the individual level. So what's interesting about this archive is there's a lot of material concerning the lead up to December 7, 1941. And what I wanna to touch upon before moving on really comes down to grandpa being a legal officer had a lot of correspondence between the top officers and just to fast forward a little bit, there is some interesting material because this archive contains correspondence between General Marshall and General Short. And I'd like to touch upon the first communication between General Marshall and General Short, which was actually dated February 7, 1941. So a good 10 months before. Now this is from Marshall to Short. And given that we're a Naval History Channel, I want to use this document to sort of set the tone of the command structure of the Hawaiian Islands. So, General Marshall the Short, my dear Short, I believe you take over command today. However, the reason for this letter is a conversation I had yesterday with Admiral Stark. He spoke of Admiral Kimmel, the new fleet commander, regarding his personal characteristics. He said Kimmel was very direct, even brusque and undiplomatic in his approach to problems, that he was at heart a very kindly man though he appeared rather rough in his methods of doing business. I gathered that he is entirely responsive to plain speaking on the part of the other fellow, if there is frankness and logic in the presentation. Stark went so far as to say that he had in the past personally objected to Kimmel's manners in dealing with officers, but that Kimmel was outstanding in his qualifications for command and that this was the opinion of the entire Navy. I give you this as it may be helpful in your personal dealings with Admiral Kimmel. Not that I anticipate that you would be super sensitive, but rather that you would have a full understanding of the man with whom you are to deal. Admiral Stark said that Kimmel had written him at length about the deficiencies of army material for the protection of Pearl Harbor. He referred specifically to planes and to anti-aircraft guns. Of course, the facts are as he represents them regarding planes and to a less serious extent regarding caliber 50 machine guns. The three inch anti-aircraft gun is on a better basis. What Kimmel does not realize is that we are tragically lacking in this material throughout the army and that Hawaii is on a far better basis than any other command in the army. The fullest protection for the fleet is rather than a major consideration for us, there can be little question about that, but the Navy itself makes demands on us for commands other than Hawaii, which makes it difficult for us to meet the requirements of Hawaii. For example, as I told Admiral Stark yesterday, he had been pressing me heavily to get some modern anti-aircraft guns in the Philippines for the protection of Cavite, where they had been collected a number of submarines as well as the vessels of the Asiatic fleet. At the present time, we have no anti-aircraft guns for the protection of Cavite and very little for Corregidor. By unobtrusively withdrawing three-inch guns from regiments now in the field in active training, we have obtained 23-inch guns for immediate shipment to the Philippines. However, before the shipment has gotten underway, the Navy requested 18 of these guns for Marine battalions to be specifically equipped for the defense of the islands in the Pacific. So I am left with two guns for the Philippines. This has happened time and again. And until quality produ production is underway, we are in the most difficult situation in these matters. You should make clear to Admiral Kimmel that we are doing everything that is humanly possible to build up the army defenses of naval overseas installations, but we cannot perform a miracle. I arranged yesterday to ship 31 of the P-36 planes to Hawaii by aircraft carrier from San Diego in about 10 days. This will give you 50 of this type of plane, deficient in speed compared to the Japanese carrier-based pursuit and deficient in armament, but it at least gives you 50 of the same type. I have also arranged with Admiral Stark to ship 50 P-40B pursuit planes about March 15 by naval carrier from San Diego. These planes just came into production this week and should be in a quantity basis in about eight a day by the first week of March. The Japanese carrier-based pursuit plane, which has presently appeared in China, according to our information, has a speed of 322 miles an hour. 
a very rapid ability to climb and mounts two 20 millimeter and two 30 cal machine guns. It has leak proof tanks and armor. Our P-40B will have a speed of 360 miles an hour with two 50 cal machine guns and four of 30 cal. It will lack the rapidity to climb of the Japanese planes. It will have leak proof tanks and armor. We have an earlier model of this plane, the P-40, delivered in August and October, but the Chief of Air Corps opposes sending it to Hawaii because of some engine defect which makes it unsafe for training flights over water. Up to the present time, we have not had available a modern medium bomber or a light bomber. This month, the medium bomber will go into production, if not quantity production. This plane has a range of, without bombs, of 3,000 miles, carries 2,000 pounds, and a speed of 320 miles an hour a tremendous improvement on the old B-18, which you now have. It can operate with bombs 640 miles to sea with a safe reserve against the return trip. We plan to give you first priority on these planes. I am looking into the question of providing at least a squadron of flying fortresses for Hawaii. I am seeing what can be done to augment the 50 caliber machine gun setup, but I have no hope for the next few months. The Navy approached us in regarding barrage balloons we have three now under test and 80 in the process of manufacture and 3,000 to be procured if the president will release our estimates. However, this provides nothing against the next few months. I am looking into the question of possibly obtaining some from England, but they're, they are asking us and not giving us these days. The first test of the first 40 deliveries in June will probably be made in Hawaii. So I'd like to stop right there just because this document is fascinating in a lot of ways because it's already showing that the command environment in Hawaii is structured such that the army is responsible for the defense of the fleet in Pearl Harbor. And it's very clearly illustrated that the army is facing shortages and competing with the Navy for resources at this point in time, because the United States war industry hadn't cranked up to full volume. The other fascinating thing in the document, why I kept going on when it was describing aircraft types is they discussed the Japanese zero. Now, there's some inaccuracies there. There is definitely an inaccuracy regarding leak proof tanks, because we all know the Zero didn't have any armor. But they knew from Claire Chenault's reports in China that there was a very advanced Japanese carrier based pursuit plane that had the potential to outperform American aircraft. And you don't see that in a lot of the histories of the Pacific War. It's always that they didn't know about the Zero, it was a shock, Chenault gave the warning, but it's very clear that the right people were listening to Claire Chenault. Uh, yeah. I touched upon this in my Pensacola Aerospace Museum. I've been doing a lot of, of posts on the lead up to December 7th that I'm kind of using to set this material in context. And I've written a series about the Kido Butai and I've written a series sort of dovetailing the US Navy and kind of zigzagging back and forth. And what's amazing about this is my pieces on the Kido Butai have hit really nicely on both sides. I had originally posted it on a Facebook group about Japanese warships. And in a subject like Pearl Harbor, when you have two, two sides perspectives, you have to cover the history from both sides. Warfare does not take place in a vacuum. There are, it's a give and take. And so you need to look at both perspectives. And what I tried to do in writing this series about the Kido Butai was I tried to give the worldview of the Japanese from Imperial Japan's command level of the combined fleet all the way down to the individual cockpit level. So what you're looking at is that the Japanese, as of July of 1941, had their oil embargoed by the United States. And because of that, Imperial Japan was conducting a conflict in China. And this particular conflict in China had been going on since 1937 which is why Claire Chenault was there. And part of the ultimatum we gave the Japanese was that if they didn't cease their activities in China, that we would, we would basically cut them off. And one of the things that occurred at that time was that the Japanese had occupied French Indochina, which was the final act which precipitated the oil embargo. So the United States embargoed Japan's oil in July of 41, the Dutch followed suit shortly thereafter. This is one of the forgotten chapters of the Pacific War, and it's one that I'm really going to speak to on this archive because 
When I was a child, I remember looking at a World War II map and I saw what Indonesia looked like, except the World War II map called it the Dutch East Indies. And that fascinated me. You know, I thought this was Indonesia, but no, it's the Dutch East Indies. So I looked into the history of that and, you know, found out as a child that the Dutch had owned Indonesia for 300 odd years. And during that time, as the 20th century came into being and the need for petroleum products increased exponentially around the world, one of the largest oil companies on earth, Shell, it was Royal Dutch Shell at the time, and Indonesia was one of the largest suppliers of oil in the world. And they were in the top three, the United States, Persia, and of course the Dutch East Indies. So when the United States cut off Japan's oil and the Dutch East Indies followed suit, Imperial Japan basically had the choice of giving up the empire in China it had been building up since 1894 or doing something to secure that oil supply. And of course, when you set things into the, the time period, you're looking at Holland had been occupied by Nazi Germany in 1940. So the Dutch East Indies was basically defenseless. It had to see to its own defenses and it had a lot of money because of the oil. They were able to get a lot of American equipment, but when they lost their home country and they're an overseas colony and they're a tiny, tiny island of European colonists in the sea of local Indonesians, you're dealing with a situation where there's a lot of potential for trouble on all levels. And when you are sitting on an oil patch and the Japanese are lacking oil, you're going to be the strategic prize of the war. So that was what was going on. And as this was going on, the United States was doing its best to see to the defenses of the Pacific. And touching back on this Marshall document, the top military officers of the United States knew that some form of conflict was going to come. So a lot of the hist histories of Pearl Harbor, you know, they treat it as a surprise attack. How dare the Japanese do that? They, you know, I get it. And it was a terrible thing. And there were a series of mix-ups that occurred. But when you look at the actual sequence of events and put it hour by hour, and you see the timing of everything, you see how there was a tragic series of miscalculations on both sides. And Yamamoto was against the war, but he is the one that implemented the war plan. And another fascinating series of documents that found in this is as the Japanese were planning for the war, they did an endless series of war games. And I have an Intel bulletin from December 8th, 1944, where it's from the Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet. It's in a semi-glossy magazine format. And it talks about an interrogation report of a Japanese POW who was captured on Saipan. He was a chief yeoman. A yeoman being the people that keep track of naval correspondence and do calculations. And this chief yeoman was basically a human calculator. His job was to do calculations for the staff of the combined fleet when it came down to figuring out things like fuel consumption so they could calculate ship radius, plane radius, everything else. This man also apparently had a photographic memory. So what you're able to see in this intelligence bulletin is the man has almost total recall of the calculations he did. And of all things, the device he used to calculate was a little tidbit of history I found fascinating, which is that he did the fuel calculations for the Imperial fleet using an abacus. And, and when you, that, that to me sums up a lot of the difference between Imperial Japan and the United States. You would have thought that if they're running fuel calculations in, in a Western country, they'd be using slide rules or an IBM calculator machine, some sort of modern device. And here you have this chief yeoman of the Imperial fleet using an abacus in order to give the admirals in charge, okay, we're gonna send fleet A here, we're gonna send fleet B there, what's the radius, how much fuel do they have, how long can they remain on station? And it's all done, click, 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 with an abacus. So getting back to things on what's going on, the Japanese are endlessly wargaming every potential scenario. And that's one of the things culturally that you can see about Japanese as a people is when they come together and make a plan, they're already a unified culture. 
But when they make a plan, they can make an invincible plan. Unfortunately, as Sun Tzu says, no plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. And unfortunately, as Midway would later prove, if a plan gets altered in any way or some unforeseen circumstance happens, a plan can fall apart. And if you don't have a backup plan to adjust for the primary plan failing, you might be in a bit of trouble. But the Japanese war plan for Pearl Harbor was brilliant. And it involved taking out the US Pacific fleet specifically because if the Japanese were gonna invade the Dutch East Indies and seize the oil, they would be dealing with a threat to their flank. Their ships are traveling south from Japan and they'd also have to deal with the Philippines. So when you, when you look at Pearl Harbor, you have to look at the entire theater in the Pacific. You have to look at the Philippines, you have to look at Hawaii, and you have to consider that, yes, there were war warnings. Everybody knew that some form of conflict was going to happen, especially after the oil embargo. Because Imperial Japan was in a way backed into a corner and they were not going to back down from their conflict in China. And the United States was doing all sorts of things behind the scenes because there was a group of American aviators that were recruited for a certain innocuous sounding organization called the Civil Aircraft Manufacturing Company. And these folks were all Camco employees and they were traveling to the Far East with fake passports, listing them as missionaries and acrobats. And they were going to Burma because the Japanese in their endless China war had basically seized the entire coast of China. So China had no way of getting supplies in and sustaining its war effort against the Japanese, except through the port of Rangoon in Burma, where the supplies could be offloaded in British territory and then transferred across the border via the Burma Road. So you are seeing both sides gearing up for war. The United States is in a situation where we're just getting our war industry started and Lend-Lease was occurring by mid-1941. The invasion of the Soviet Union happened. Everybody knows there's going to be war. And FDR has made his campaign promise to get his third term in 1940 by saying, I'm not going to send American boys off to war. But he knows a war is coming. And the British Empire is fighting for its very survival. I mean, when you think about mid-41 on the British side, look at what's going on. You have Crete, you have the Mediterranean theater, you have the British Empire where if they lose the Med, if they, if they lose North Africa and Malta in particular, how are they going to get supplies from India other than going all the way around the Cape of Good Hope, which they did in a lot of cases. And you had Cunningham running the British Mediterranean fleet from Malta. And my favorite Cunningham quote is what you've had in your channel many times. You know? Takes three years to build a warship, 300 years to build a tradition. And just as the Battle of Britain was the RAF's finest hour, I do believe that the, the actions off Crete and the evacuation was one of the Royal Navy's finest hours as well. So you have that strategic environment. All over the world, there's a shortage of weapons and you have countries arming to the teeth, both that are fighting and that are neutral. And you had the United States, which until the Lend-Lease Act was passed, was selling arms to the belligerents, France, and after the fall of France to Britain, on a cash and carry basis, which caused a lot of financial turmoil because the British Empire's gold reserves were going to pay for those, those weapons. And so you have all sorts of competing demands for the weapons that are going to Hawaii. And it's just amazing that you have the chief of staff of the United States Army and you have the Navy Department quibbling over 23 inch anti-aircraft guns and no idea where to put them, you know? And the other thing that's fascinating about that 20 guns is those, those units that were being formed up to be equipped with those three inch anti-aircraft guns were Marine Corps Defense Battalions out of which they were putting those units on the outer perimeter of the Hawaiian Islands. So you had a defense battalion on Midway eventually and a defense de battalion on a place we know of as Wake Island. And that's where those 23 inch anti-aircraft guns were coming. Now, I guess it, it shows a couple of things, doesn't it? It's one is 
when we're talking about 1941, although the industrial potential of the United States is there, the actual industrial production that we're so used to thinking of when it comes to World War II hasn't quite spooled up yet, because we're talking we're talking there about, as you say, the, they're quibbling about the Navy requisitioning a number of guns that's the equivalent to later in the war, you know, barrel-wise, the same number as you'd find as the heavy anti-aircraft arm of a single battleship and their smaller guns, their three inch, not five inch. That's but this right. is the but this battery. is this is everything they've managed to scrape together at this point. Um and they're robbing our units in the field in out in the fields uh it back in the states to even to just to get these. And as as you mentioned, you know, there's no real air defense at this point in the Philippines. Um so it's not a case of oh, the US can just turn around and swamp the world with guns and ships. It can do a few years from now, but not in 1940 right. and 41. Um, and I suppose the other thing is, um, as you highlighted about the Dutch East Indies, people have to understand that it might sound a bit odd on the face of it to say, well, the Japanese wanted oil from the Netherlands, therefore they blew up Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a chain of logic as you explained you know they've got to calculate how much fuel do we need to take the dutch east indies well if we do that the philippines are right there they'll they'll hit us from the flank so we need to take out the philippines so how much fuel do we need to burn to you take the philippines first but if we take the philippines that's u.s territory so the pacific fleet will try and attack us so we have to take out the pacific fleet before we attack the philippines and the pacific fleet at least in late 1941, is in Hawaii, which means we now have to go to Hawaii and we have to calculate all the fuel for that as well. So you've now got the three whole military campaigns, at least, which you've got to calculate all your fuel expenditure for, and you've got to launch all of them before your oil reserves hit a point where you can't run them all. Because there's no point if you let your fuel reserves go down, you're like, oh, yes, well, we blew up the year specifically and we took the Philippines and now we're out of fuel, so we can't actually take the Dutch East Indies. Well, one thing I want to touch upon in that, too, that I didn't mention in my spiel before was the Two Ocean Navy Act was passed in 1940. So the Japanese knew that the industrial might of the United States would surpass them by 1943, which is what actually happened. The Essex Swarm was being built. And there's some fascinating documents uh, that I've seen before, not related to this, but, you know, FDR himself discussed the naming conventions of the Essex class. And he wanted to choose the great ships of the old sailing Navy because FDR, of course, being assistant secretary in the Navy in World War I, was very much a maritime enthusiast. So when you get to the construction of the Two Ocean Navy, you have the, the top officers of the Imperial Japanese Navy, Yamamoto in particular, who has who have lived in the United States, and now they're dealing with a situation where they know what the industrial might of the United States is. They know that those ships are going to be put into the ocean. The United States had started, you know, it's second to none Navy in 1916 and achieved parity with the Royal Navy. And getting back into the 20 year period before the war, because everybody seems to forget World War I, everybody knows the sequel, but World War II was the sequel. After the arms race of World War I, you had the Washington Naval Treaty, which limited Japan to the 553 ratio. And the Japanese were very upset about that. They were an extremely status conscious nation and they didn't want to feel like they were a second class nation. And they referred to the agreement as the Rolls Rolls Ford agreement. And you had the Japanese in a position where by late 1941, they knew that if they didn't strike, they would be vastly outnumbered by the Pacific Fleet and by the United States Navy as a whole by the time the war would begin later on. So they needed to strike from a position of maximum strength. And if they didn't, they knew that they were going to be vastly outnumbered. So in going on on this, I want to discuss sort of events immediately up to December 7th as we're touching upon the highlights and where this document brings the Dutch, or excuse me, where this archive brings the Dutch East Indies into focus is the fact that in the lead up to December 7, 1941, you had a war warning sent on November 27, 1941. And that war warning went out to all, to all commands. And interestingly enough, there were two different versions of that war warning. One went out to the War Department, which ran the Army, and a different one went out to the Navy Department. But at any rate, the 
the commanders involved in the Pacific, both of the Asiatic fleet, which was stationed in the Philippines, and the Pacific fleet, which is relevant to Pearl Harbor, both of those top commanders knew that something was coming. And there were reports of a Japanese invasion convoy departing French Indochina. And that convoy was headed to points unknown, perhaps the Kra Isthmus, perhaps the islands to the south. Nobody really knew, but a convoy was going up. And what I've done in my Pensacola Aerospace Museum, which is now just a Facebook, I'm waiting for our nonprofit to be approved in order to go to a .org. So I can be fully, fully ethical in all this. But regarding what's been going on is I've done a series of posts in the lead up to December 7th, including the Pete Obutai series I touched upon before. And what you're looking at is in late November of 41, everybody knew war was coming. And Admiral Hart was literally on the tip of the spear. He was the front line because the Philippines, as you discussed before, were going to be the Japanese target. So Admiral Hart, his only real air assets were the PBY Catalinas of Patrol Wing 10. And he actually got in touch with his commander of the Patrol Wing 10 and briefed specific pilots, his most experienced naval aviators operating these PBYs. And he started sending them on spying missions right up to French Indochina. And as that was going on, he was able to keep tabs of the movement of those convoys. And what's fascinating is he was the one that was generating the war warnings. Those war warnings of a Japanese convoy leading to, leading to points unknown were coming from the reconnaissance reports of those PBYs of the Asiatic fleet. So you have a situation where everybody knows something is coming. You have the Dutch were extremely vulnerable. You have the British Empire, which the Kra Isthmus is basically Malaya Thailand border. And so this convoy is going somewhere. Where is it going? Who's, who, are they, who are they going to attack? And you have reconnaissance going on. So as November of 41 draws to a close and we're getting into the first days of December, you have a, a rather interesting message that appears from the president himself where he is instructing Admiral Hart in charge of the Asiatic fleet to ready three small naval vessels to form. And this is what's fascinating. And I touched upon this in my Facebook post to form a quote where they actually spell out the word quote in a message. And, you know, official message traffic is usually noted for its brevity. So a quote spelled out defensive information patrol spelled out again, unquote. Minimum requirement being that basically it's officered by Navy, flies the flag, has a gun or two, but be careful, don't use too many machine guns, we're still short of them. And he also wanted to minimize the number of ratings involved. In other words, naval enlisted personnel, Filipinos could be used as crew. And he sent one of the most useless vessels of the Asiatic fleet, the USS Isabel, which was a patrol yacht, and that particular vessel was the relief flagship for the Asiatic fleet. And Isabel had been a civilian yacht that had been commandeered during World War I. She sort of had destroyer lines, but she wasn't nearly as fast as a four piper. And she bobbed around the Pacific on the China coast between China and the Philippines as the relief flagship. So basically the commander of the Asiatic fleet's personal yacht. Not a vessel that you really need to use if there was war coming. So it was considered expendable. And also two other small vessels, which... This is where it gets really fascinating. They were both Copra schooners, little inner island trading vessels, one of which was commissioned right up on the eve of the war on December 6th, I believe, the USS Lanikai. And the commander of the USS Lanikai is one of the more fascinating and colorful figures in all naval history. And I'd, I'd like to touch upon him because he is who compiled all this information we now have about the Asiatic fleet. And his name is Rear Admiral Kemp Tolley. And he wrote an absolutely amazing series of books as a serving officer, sort of a trilogy about his naval career. And the first of these books is Yangtze Patrol, where he talks about what it's like to be on the Yangtze Patrol in the heart of China, serving on those gunboats that used to chug up the Yangtze. And most famously was depicted by the film, The uh, Sand Pebbles with Steve McQueen. 
And that was a force that had been in being in China since the 1850s when, when Matthew Calvert Perry first opened Japan to Western trade. And the China station was considered one of the most popular duty stations in the pre-World War II United States Navy because the economic situation in China was such that even uh, sailors pay at the lowest level, they could afford houseboys, they could afford servants. And, you know, the sand pebbles sort of over-exaggerated that where they had the Chinese servants in the engine room. But basically, if you read any account of what it was like to be a sailor in the Asiatic fleet, you just basically shouted out an order and the Chinese cook would cook it. Your, all your gear was folded and polished. You, you were living like a king off of even sailor's pay. And you had lots of, lots of the greater characters in naval service that didn't like the discipline of the stateside Navy. They would be in China and they were known as China hands. And when they came back to the States, a lot of them would have embroidered dragons within their, uh, their jumpers. And that was the mark. They would roll up their sleeve and show the, the silk dragon to let everybody else know they were a sailor in the Asiatic fleet. And so these China sailors were operating in gunboats. We had a small gunboat fleet. And of course, one of those gunboats was sunk in December 18, 1937, the USS Panay. And the Japanese claimed that they made a mistake. They paid compensation. There was a newsreel photographer, cameraman who was taking reel and they actually confiscated some of his frames because they showed the Japanese aircraft so close. And there was basically no doubt that this was going on. So Kemp Tolly was a was a gunboat sailor and he he enjoyed that duty enough that he was returning for his third tour of duty in the Asiatic fleet and he was assigned as executive officer aboard the USS Wake. And the Wake is a fascinating vessel because she served under multiple flags and multiple names. So the Wake was launched in the late 20s as the USS Guam and the girl who christened her, apparently, instead of doing the normal phraseology, actually, when she broke the bottle of, I believe, water because it was prohibition in an American vessel, but she, she said, she basically blessed the vessel in the name of the Father, the Spirit, and the Holy Ghost. And Wake, ever since, lived a very charmed life. And it's one of those things that Kemp Tolley, when he, when he relates the story, basically says he, he gave that ship some incredible joss. And so the wake was all the way up in Hankou, China, which is fairly far up the Yangtze. And the war is winding down. And Kemp Tali is now in these basically empty European clubs in the heart of China and Japanese occupied China. His only social life is to entertain with the Japanese officers who are being politely correct in their dealings, but they know something's up. And as the gates are about to shut, uh, the USS Wake actually makes it all the way to Shanghai. And just to touch upon her name, the wake was originally the Guam, but they were building these, as you've discussed in one of your prior episodes, a battle cruiser slash large cruiser of the Alaska class. And they were naming these ships after territories, so they needed to free up the name Guam. And so the gunboat USS Guam became the gunboat USS Wake, and the name Guam was assigned to the new large cruiser that was being constructed. So the... USS Wake makes it to Shanghai. Kemp Tolly basically is reassigned as a navigator aboard the USS Oahu, a slightly bigger gunboat. They decide that the Wake is too small, so they're going to leave her with a skeleton crew of, of radio men, uh, basically to act as the communications antenna for the United States Consulate in Shanghai. And the USS Oahu ends up traveling across the South China Sea, her consort, just as the war is about to start, through the middle of a typhoon in Lee of Taiwan, which was then Formosa, with Imperial Japanese fleet units shadowing them, signaling them to heave to, and Admiral Glassford, who is in charge of the Yangtze patrol, is signaling back, I do not understand. And they managed to make it all the way through this series of storms, and finally, right before December 7th, uh, December, fourth, I believe, going into the fifth, the gunboats make it to Manila and Kemp Tali reports to Admiral Hart for new orders to assume command of the USS Lanikai. 
which used to be a German Copra schooner that was a prize of war captured by the United States Navy in, in World War I, and then used as a kind of a tender yacht as the USS Hermes, and then sold out of service. She was involved in some film production work in uh, the 1930s, and she found herself in the Philippines, and now this particular vessel, a schooner, from almost the turn of the century has been recommissioned into the US Navy as a vessel of war in order to, in order to follow the order given by the president of the United States himself for three small naval vessels, uh, one of which was the Isabel, the other of which was the Monikai, and there was a third vessel about to be fitted out, the Molly Moore, but unfortunately she was not able to be fitted out. And so what you're looking at is you're looking at FDR himself creating a Japanese bait force, or excuse me, a force to bait the Japanese. Because the idea is, we know that something is coming. We know that these convoys are going out. What can the United States do to intervene in a way that's not going to look like the United States is the aggressor? And what better way than to have a similar incident to the Panay being sunk in 1937 than to have a, a small U.S. naval vessel, so you're taking minimal losses off the coast of occupied French Indochina, and the Japanese sink one, and now the United States can claim that an American vessel is attacked in international waters, and we have a pretext to go into war. And to go into war to intervene in, in support of the British and the Dutch East Indies, which are the strategic objectives of the Japanese. So in looking at all this, Kemp Tolley is captain of a bait ship. He has a vested interest as a survivor to record all the information he can about the circumstances that led him right after he escapes from China on a gunboat, a flat bottom gunboat that would roll up to 50 degrees past the inclinometer limits as they were going through this typhoon. He just makes it to the Philippines thinking, oh, thank goodness. And now man is in a situation where he is being given command of a bait ship and his job is to basically let himself get sunk by the Japanese. And Lanikai ended up having a fascinating history because Pearl Harbor happens. Now there's no need for a pretext ship. So what are you going to do? Well, the allied air forces in, particularly the Far East Air Force in the Philippines was virtually wiped out on December 8th, which is a point where I wanna to touch upon later. So now you have a situation where Admiral Hart, commander of the Asiatic fleet, orders his surface units south. They're gonna establish a rally point in the Dutch East Indies and cooperate with ABDA so there's no need for surface ship officers or surface ship infrastructure in the Philippines, and those officers have to get out. And fortunately for Kemp Tolley, Admiral Hart's flag lieutenant, Skip Adair, lieutenant commander, a flag lieutenant is going to be rather close to an admiral and have connections that a normal lieutenant commander is not going to have. So Skip Adair brought a party of officers aboard the Lanikai and arranged for the Asiatic fleet to give permission for the Lanikai to depart south. So now you have the fascinating story of a schooner in the heart of World War II as the most advanced fleet in World War II is rampaging all over Asia. And you have a party of officers aboard a schooner from the, a classic sailing ship, a windjammer, working their way south from the Philippines through the Dutch East Indies and literally the entire time being only about a step or so ahead of the Japanese. And in each situation, potentially being ordered to remain and be captured or killed by the Japanese, but Hart's flag lieutenant is able to make the right phone call and get in touch with the right person to release them. And they managed to be one of the few vessels of the Asiatic fleet, along with a few of the destroyers and other ships that left before the climactic battles of that campaign. The little sailing ship Lanikai makes it all the way to Australia, along with the USS Isabel, ironically enough, enough the ship that was the other bait ship which on December 6, 1941, the Isabel was December 6, local time. That's another thing. We have international dateline to deal with, so dates can get confusing. But on December 6, 1941, you have the, the USS Isabel, the relief flagship of the Asiatic fleet off the coast of French Indochina, being shadowed by the Japanese, both surface vessels, and at one point, a uh, E-13A Jake, as we later called it, float plane, was orbiting over the USS Isabel at an altitude of 1,000 feet, 2,000 yards away, which my background is as a professional aviator, and I spent years training future naval aviators for 
the United States Navy's initial flight screening program. And quite a few of them are most likely going to watch this because I'm letting them know. And so in aviation, as a professional aviator, you get a sense of altitudes. You know what altitudes are, you know, high and low. And when you're dealing in small aircraft, 1,000 feet is not a lot. The FAA rule for minimum altitude over a populated area is only 1,000 feet. And the view from there, as you look down, you can see lots of details. It's pretty obvious. Um, back on my hallway wall, I have a painting of the uh, USS Independence because when she was being uh, fitted out, I got to watch her sea trials in Mobile Bay. The tragic thing that she's no longer in service, but I'm not a big fan of the LCS, but she's a memento because I saw her in, in her sea trials. And when you fly over a warship or any ship, you can see a lot of details. Um, aircraft recognition can cause issues for aviators, but when you're at a thousand feet, you can see individual crew members walking around. You know what that ship is. So when you're orbiting 2,000 yards away at a thousand feet, looking at a ship, you, the Japanese most likely knew it was an American warship, but they had bigger things happening to the east and about to happen in that region. So they did not take the bait. And the Isabel, of all things, the ship that could have been the pretext to start World War II in the Pacific, ends up being one of the lucky ships to escape out of the Asiatic fleet and make it down to Australia. So getting back to what's going on, I want to read something else that really sets the tone as to what the night of, or what the week leading up to December 7th would be in the Hawaiian Islands. This document was written after the fact in 1943, but it really sets the tone for what was going on. Now, my grandfather, the night before, had been at that conference for food supply in Hawaii. And he's talking about kind of the lead up in Hawaii for what's going on. For several days preceding the 7th of December, a Kona wind had been blowing on the island of Oahu. It is a southerly wind and one which the Hawaiians call a sick wind. During such periods, the weather is extremely humid, close, sultry and oppressive, as distinguished from the fresh and invigorating weather which prevailed with, when trade winds are blowing from the Northeast. The morning of Sunday, December 7, 1941, dawned clear dry with few if any clouds in the sky. The wind was gradually veering towards the Northeast and was in a direction of approximately from due North at the time of the Japanese attack. Observers do not agree as to the exact time of the attack, which is understandable by reason of the fact that simultaneous attacks were launched at various portions of the island and by individual airplanes whose missions and objectives had been carefully mapped out in advance. The first airplane appeared over Hickam Field and adjacent Pearl Harbor at 0757 and attacked the battleship Arizona and other large capital ships berthed in Pearl Harbor, the Hawaiian Air Depot, the hangar lines and parked airplanes at Hickam Field and swooping low and at an altitude of approximately 150 to 200 feet. In that, I want to stop at that point because I just wanted to set up the context for the weather and what the environment would look like. Yeah, so we, I mean, it's this is one of the things that's incredibly important to understand is why this is happening. You know, a lot of people, well, not necessarily a lot of people, but sometimes you do get this impression, especially from what I like to call pop history. Um, you know, the, the sound bites you sometimes get on uh, TV documentaries, where if you actually compress the amount of information they're giving, rather than just fancy music and graphics, it's probably about four minutes of speaking. <laughs> and you kind of get this pressure, all oh, the Japanese showed up out of nowhere. No one, nobody could possibly have expected that there would be tension and war between Japan and America. But in actual fact, no, everyone, everyone on both sides pretty knew, pretty much knew that war was coming. The, the only real surprise at this point was the fact that it, the Japanese hit first and hit Hawaii. That, that's the only real major su surprising element about it. Although, to be fair, given the last time Japan had been, well, actually the last two times the Japanese had been at war with any kind of major power, when they went to war with Russia in the 1900s and then when they went to war with Germany in 1914, both times they had this interesting ability of showing up at the places they wanted to attack before they'd officially told anyone they were going to attack them. <laughs> So, that, that is one of the things that, that I, I really, that gets me about this is that 
the Japanese surprise attack on Port Arthur in 1904, when they declared war as torpedoes were in the water towards the capital ships on the first Russian Pacific. Now, at this point in time, I'd like to go ahead, since we're, we've worked our way up to December 7th, and mm. I'd like to work my way up to my grandfather's statement on that day. And mm -hmm. then I want to touch upon, of course, you know, ping-ponging back and forth with you, because if you have any observation, please jump into this. But mm -hmm. I want to read this particular document and basically explain what it's like. And if you hear some clinking in the background, it's mm -hmm. because I'm wearing my grandpa's dog tags. And as I was discussing earlier, this may be one of the tags he was wearing on December 7th. I'm not 100% sure, but I also have his World War I tag. So, on the evening of Saturday, December 6th, 1941, Mrs. Cobb and I had returned from Schofield Barracks about midnight and were invited to spend the night at Hickam Field with some friends, Lieutenant F.O. Brown and his sister at their quarters in that post. We were awakened at 7.55 the following morning by attack by enemy planes on Pearl Harbor and Hickam Field. The attacks continued intermittently throughout the morning. We were assisted in such ways as we could to care for the wounded and the dead until about noon. At that time, I left Hickam Field and proceeded to Fort Shafter. Reporting upon arrival to my superior, Colonel T.H. Green, Department Judge Advocate, volunteer nurses were needed at Tripler General Hospital. Colonel Green made arrangements for Mrs. Cobb to help there in that work. After taking her to the hospital, I was directed to report to the Chief of Staff, Hawaiian Department, at Fort Shafter for duty, which I did at 1.20 p.m. December 7, 1941. Upon assuming my duties in the Office of Chief of Staff, I immediately began to keep a personal record of the activities in the office, pursuant to my instructions and as a matter of ordinary office routine, which record I now have. The telephone system was explained to me, and I was occupied for some time becoming familiar with the office. The situation was of course very intense and numerous officers were calling on the chief of staff throughout the afternoon. Colonel Green accompanied by Major Henley of the judge advocate's office were in about 2 p.m. and shortly thereafter left to go to the crater to confer with General Short. Colonel Phillips was busy with long distance phone calls to Washington, at least one of which I understand to be completed. Some officer whose name I do not know called in person to report to the chief of staff on the situation at Hickam Field. At about 3 p.m., a secret radio message was received by the chief of staff, which was shown to me, and which referred to the fact that the Japanese were serving what amounted to an ultimatum at one o'clock p.m. that day. We were unable to, uh, to understand this message, inasmuch as the Japanese had made and concluded their assault on Pearl Harbor at Hickam Field approximately seven hours previously. In discussing the message with Colonel Phillips, he remarked that this must be the message to which General Marshall was referring and which he asked if I had received. As I recall, the message was dated and stamped as having been sent from Washington at 12.18 p.m. December 7, 1941. I am positive that the message was not received by the Chief of Staff Hawaiian Department before 2.55 p.m. December 7, 1941 at the first. Shortly thereafter, I heard the chief of staff phone the contents of the message to General Short at the crater near Fort Shafter. An additional message was prepared by Colonel Phillips, the contents of which I do not know. And I was directed to proceed to Pearl Harbor with a secret message and the second message and deliver both to Admiral Kimmel. I left Fort Shafter in an official car at 3.42 p.m. and rushed to Admiral Kimmel's headquarters where I delivered both messages to his chief of staff, Captain Davis, with whom I conversed for some time. There were more discussions about the time of the secret message, and we attempted to account for the delay in transmittal. Thereafter, Admiral Kimmel wrote in longhand a message to General Short, consisting of three pages of note paper, about five by seven inches in size, the last of the three being about one half filled with the writing. This message he showed to two other admirals who were conferring with him, sealed the same and delivered to me with instructions to deliver it to General Short at once. Before I left Pearl Harbor, an officer whose name is Delaney, this is where I have to pause for a moment, second page, but whose rank I do not know as he was in civilian clothes, gave me a message concerning the naval vessels which were to enter the harbor that night so that our coastal batteries would not fire on them. I then returned with the three messages, the pink secret message, the Admiral's note, and Delaney's advice to Fort Shafter, where I arrived at 4.16 p.m. I delivered the messages to Colonel Phillips, 
who opened the Admiral's note and after reading it again sealed it with sealing wax with the assistance of Mr. Emmons in the office and directed me to take it to the general in the crater at once, which I did. After reading the message, General Short called Colonel Phillips and told him in substance, I have read the Admiral's note and I will keep it in my personal possession. He then asked me my name, which I gave him, and he directed me to return to Fort Shafter. The time of arrival there was 4.40 p.m., after which my attention was occupied by other matters. Now, that is my grandfather's statement to the Pearl Harbor Commission. It's actually been published before in December 7, 1941 by Gordon Prang, but not in its entirety. And I find this document to be absolutely fascinating because it's one of those family history things where the Army and Navy were separate entities in Hawaii. There wasn't a joint staff. There wasn't a PATCOM headquarters back then that was ecumenical inter-service. You had two distinct cabinet level departments, the War Department and the Navy Department, and they had their own hierarchies and chains of command. So when Grandpa keeps mentioning the crater, what he's talking about is General Short, Lieutenant General Walter Short was in Aliomanu Crater, which was a kind of a hidden command post behind Fort Chapter. Not very far away, but it's basically a volcanic crater that the general has his command post and he's there. The headquarters Hawaiian department is the next nerve center, but of course it's vulnerable to aerial bombing. So the other thing that's fascinating, of course, is the timing of the telegram, because we all know from the traditional Pearl Harbor from Tora 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 on that they sent the message from Washington via commercial radiogram, and it was delivered by a local Japanese kid on a scooter that he showed up in the office after the attack at Fort Shafter. And, you know, they, they do show, I believe, an enlisted man giving the, giving the message to, as, as the messenger, but the messenger boy was actually my grandfather, who was in his high 40s and a World War I veteran. But looking at this, I could honestly say that my grandfather was one of the few, if not one of the only individuals to meet with both Walter Short and husband E. Kimmel on that day. And so it's a fascinating glimpse into both the top command structure and what's going on. And I love the little vignette about yeah, Admiral Kimmel showing two other admirals, and then they sort of come to a consensus. And I have that particular document as well, uh, just basically reporting on the losses to the Pacific fleet. But it's one of those situations where my grandfather goes back to headquarters Hawaiian department and What's fascinating in, in this particular document is he has the message slip of when he reported in for duty and he has pencil written notes. So from the nerve center of the United States Army on December 7th, here's a pile of papers that have been around for almost exact, well, exactly 80 years as this airs of what was going on and what the U.S. Army was dealing with in Hawaii on that day. Yeah, and I suppose it's also a, a good reminder for everyone, because although obviously this is primarily a naval channel and everyone knows about Battleship Pro and all of this, um, sometimes people forget that, you know, of the two Japanese, wa Japanese waves of aircraft that went in, in actual fact, in both waves, the majority of the aircraft were not tasked to take on the ships. Uh, the In the first group, you had 89 Kates with a mixture of bombs and torpedoes that were going after the ships, but you also had 94 zeros and vowels, and they were going in and they were attacking places like Hickam Field and Wheeler's Field and the, the Army Air Force bases and things that weren't the capital ships. And, the and then the same thing again when you get to the, uh, the second wave attack, you've got 78 vowels again now with now now dive bombing, who are supposed to attack ships, although they're not actually very well equipped to attack the ships that are there, and the, what, the ships that are vulnerable, they end up mostly not going after anyway, the cruisers. But you, uh, in that second group, you've also got 52 Kates now armed with bombs going after Hickam Field and the other um, uh, onshore facilities again, plus another almost three dozen zeros, which again, okay, by this point, they're tangling with the occasional USAA, USAAF fighter that's got off the ground. But for the most part, they're also strafing um, airfields and other onshore facilities. So a good chunk of 
the in fact the majority of the japanese aircraft that are sent in that day aren't going after things that float they're going after things on shore and people like your grandfather are standing there what when you know you've got these attacks i guess portrayed by obviously the michael bay pearl harbor movie and you've got the more recent midway movie where you've got zeros strafing up and down the lines of ships and strafing random hospitals for no apparent reason um and well the less said about the midway movie and the mysterious like triple torpedo carrying kates and whatever and the the c4 equipped machine guns but nevertheless (laughs) um you know this is the concept that most people have of pearl harbor when in actual fact i mean not to diminish obviously what's happening on battleship row it's absolutely horrific but for the most part there's not a tremendous amount of strafing going on on battleship row it's only you know 16 inch battleship shells converted into bombs and torpedoes come screaming down through the sky but at least if you're running around on deck and not haven't haven't been exploded you're kind of okay whereas if you're over on hickam field you're being bombed you're obviously not being torpedoed fortunately but there are actually at that point you know, dozens of zeros floating around and spraying machine gun bullets and cannon rounds everywhere, which are not quite as destructive as you know, a 1,600-pound bomb if you happen to be a solid object. But if you're a person, you're probably a lot more disconcerted by several thousand rounds of small arms fire spraying in your general vicinity than you are than by one bomb that, if it lands at the other end of the runway, well, who cares? That's not you. That's right. Well, what I find interesting about all this, too, is, you know, for most people, it's Pearl Harbor only. And I want to touch upon what's going on in the macro sense. But there were echoes of Pearl Harbor all through the day because the United States was just attacked. You had the attack force structure that you just discussed. And you had a situation where the Japanese had very specific objectives. The Kido Butai was the world's most powerful carrier task force at the time. But even it had only a limited amount of resources that had to be thrown in properly. And and it's still a bit controversial as to what exact place was hit first. But if you look at it as a time and distance equation and the configuration of the Hawaiian Islands, Naval Air Station Kaneohe was definitely hit that day. And it may have been first. I've seen different accounts that said it might have been 753, which you have to take all dates with a grain of salt because who remembers exactly what time it was? Were they glancing down at their watch when they saw an explosion? You know, you have when message traffic was timestamped going out, but recollections can definitely change and be altered by your perception of an event based on what's going on all around you. So we know that Kaneohe was hit and one of the first places to hit. What was that NA Naval Air Station Kaneohe? Was the PBY scout aircraft of the Pacific Fleet. That was a brand new base. It had only been built in the late 30s going into the 1940, into the 40s. So you had that particular location. You had Wheeler Field being hit. Now, Wheeler is an interesting place because it's smack dab in the middle of the island. And so what was based at Wheeler? It was the Army Interceptor Command. So those rows and rows of P-40s that you saw, they weren't at Hickam. They were at Wheeler. And the P-40s and P-36s, both the high-level bombers and the strafing zeros were taking out the air defenses of the Hawaiian Islands. You also have what's going on in Battleship Row, You have what's going on in Fort Island and you just have a scene of utter chaos. And that's where I believe that my grandfather being a World War I veteran was sort of there to act as a a rallier, somebody that, hey, I've, I've seen this before. I've dealt with this. Let me help out. And he doesn't say much about the attack itself, but you can read a lot between the lines when intermittent attacks, dealing with the wounded and the dead. That meant, you know, comforting people as they were screaming in pain and bleeding out, dealing with dead bodies, what to do. And my grandmother was there. And of course, you know, the fact is that she would volunteer to be a nurse because she saw what was going on and how many people were maimed. And we love, I'm a, I'm a lifelong fan of aviation. I love aviation, but all too many times people forget the view from the ground. And when those things happen, the view from the ground can be pretty horrendous when you're under air attack. Getting back to uh, the other thing I find really fascinating about this document is just the command structure where <sighs> there were inter-service rivalries that really did lead to the disaster being magnified 
And if you look at a chronological timestamp of what was going on on December 7th, there was clear warning that something was about to happen because at you know four in the morning off of the entrance of Pearl Harbor, what was going on? There was a old four Piper destroyer commanded by a brand new skipper, yeah. Lieutenant Commander Outerbridge. And he saw something behind the uh, USS Antires, looked like a periscope. So he brought the ward in and he fired. The United States, by history, is the first country to fire a shot in the Pacific War because the ward opened fire on a Japanese midget submarine. And had to apparently deal with another one. There's some confusing facts on that, but a lot of things were happening early in the morning. And you had Ward messaging his chain of command, letting them know that there was a Japanese submarine sighted on the mouth of Pearl Harbor, and this is hours before the attack. Would it have made a difference in terms of scrambling everything? I mean, I've seen different documentaries that say no, now, one thing I will say is the Pacific Fleet was actually quite fortunate in being caught in Pearl Harbor because those vessels could be salvaged. Had they gone and sortied to sea searching for the Japanese fleet, they might have been sunk in the depths and never be able to be salvaged. So in that sense, though, is a blessing in disguise. And another thing which I ran into a little bit of flack on in the Imperial Japanese Navy Forum, but I won't go into that. I'll just go into the fact that what was the strategic objective of the Japanese attack in Pearl Harbor and what was the tactical objective? Sometimes those words can be interchanged properly or non-properly, but really when you look at down from the top level of command of the Imperial Japanese Navy, Admiral Yamamoto's objective was to take out the Pacific Fleet. That was the strategic objective to eliminate the threat to their flank as we talk about. What were the most powerful vessels of the Pacific Fleet? And this is where you're gonna get into a factional argument because everybody thinks that military organizations are a monolith when they're more of a mosaic of different factions. And the Kaigun, the Imperial Japanese Navy as a whole, absolutely had two distinct factions. One faction was aviation minded, the other faction was the traditional gun club. And the traditional gun club of the Japanese Navy was responsible for getting the Yamato class built where as a lot of people, including you, have said, what could they have done with the resources? They could have gotten a swarm of Zwikakus for all the resources that they put into the Amatos. But the big gun club wanted the super battleship. And those resources were diverted. Now, when you look at the air faction of the Imperial Japanese Navy, two admirals really do stand out. The first of which, of course, is Yamamoto. He knew how to wield an aircraft carrier to an effective instrument of war. As a strategic planner, his later operations had some issues. But as somebody who developed the Japanese carrier navy, along with uh, Semphill, and this was an interesting aside, but uh, I've been trying to get the proper Japanese word for a pilot. Uh, and Pirot seems to be the consensus. And of course, they took the word directly from the training they received from Semphill in uh, 1919. So Sir Frederick Semphill, who unfortunately was later arrested and not really arrested, but quietly put aside because he was actually turned out to be a Japanese spy. He was passing secret military information to the Japanese, but he is the man who is responsible for the Semphill mission back when Japan was an ally of Great Britain and the British Empire. The Royal Navy helped train the Japanese naval air arm. So one of the traditions that carried on from that time was the very word they used to describe pilot. But getting back to this, getting back to the main thread of things, when you look at Yamamoto and you look at Yamaguchi, you had the two most forward thinking Japanese officers. Both had spent time in the United States, both knew overseas cultures and customs. And they knew that the aircraft carrier was going to be the decisive weapon. That's their strike platform. The very name of the Japanese Pearl Harbor attack force, the Kido Butai, that means mobile force. It was a mobile runway. Those six aircraft carriers were mobile runways. And when you look at the, if you look at the target priority, an air-minded admiral is going to want to take out an aircraft carrier more than anything. 
because an air-minded admiral is going to recognize that that is the threat. I can inflict a lot of harm with the weapon I have, but I must be aware of my adversary's weapon. The rest of the Imperial Navy is going to still be wedded to the idea of the battle line. That's it. The battle line is the most important thing. You need to take it out. And there's a psychological thing to this as well, because aircraft carriers to the public were not seen as, as prestigious a ship as much as a battleship was. So dealing the United States a psychological blow and taking out a specific battle fleet was definitely something. But what I want to touch upon in all this, winding it back just a tiny bit, is when you look at history's view of the top commanders of Hawaii on December 7th, Admiral, Admiral Kimmel, I believe, from everything I'm seeing about his disposition to the Pacific fleet, I really do believe that the man received a bad rap. He was actively trying to position the Pacific fleet for the conflict to come. The person that really does deserve the condemnation of history more is General Short, just because he believed that the Japanese population of the islands was the primary threat. He didn't really understand the... Uh, the external threat. And it's funny because when you read these letters from Marshall to Short, you see that Short is basically being prodded by Marshall. You know, see to your anti-aircraft defenses, get along with, with Kim. Here's how you can do it. And so you have a situation where the general in charge is, is not, a, not really interfacing well with the admiral in charge. And this is an inner service mix up because you need to have both, both commanders cooperating to the best of their ability. But instead you have two separate chain of commands where their line of responsibility is a bit unclear. The army was responsible for defending the fleet when it was in Pearl Harbor because the army controlled the army air force, but the Navy itself had a scout aircraft capability. And in fact, one of the messages, uh, one of the war warning messages in response where they ended up debating whether to send army fighters to to Midway and Wake versus, you know, Nick carrier capable Marine Corps fighters. And they finally settled on the latter. But one of the big, big arguments going on was that Kimmel notes in his reply on November 28th, 1941 to the commander, the chief of Naval operations referred to as OPNAM in the message slips, but basically Kimmel replies that even though in Washington they had cooked up this plan to put army fighters onto the outer garrisons of Wake and Midway, the army fighters were not able to patrol more than 20 miles outside of, outside of a 20 mile radius of an island, which when you think about how big the Pacific Ocean is, a 20 mile radius on a tiny atoll is basically useless. And the November 28th message slip also refers to the fact that there were only 12 airworthy B-17s, or excuse me, 12 total B-17s in Hawaii, out of which only six were airworthy. So you have a situation where a massive Japanese effort is going on all over the Pacific. You don't really know where they are. Your primary scout aircraft are either the 12 B-17s, or you have a couple of dozen PBYs. I believe there were 44 of them in the islands at that point in time. And 12 of them were at Midway, and 12 more were in the lead up to this. Ad Admiral Kimmel was basically stationing his PBYs as his outer picket force. So Wake Island was at the very front line of this. And guess when Wake got hit? It's the forgotten Pearl Harbor echo because Wake Island was hit December 8th, but Wake's across the international dateline. So basically, the same time Pearl Harbor was getting hit. You had the Enterprise going out on a mission that, that was generated. Enterprise left Pearl Harbor on November 28, 1941, with VMF-211 on board. You had 12 F4F-3 Wildcats that were still in the peacetime, early light gray scheme that they, uh, they realized wasn't very effective camouflage over the water, so they oversprayed it with a non-specular sea blue. And when you look at it, it's a much more effective camouflage. And they did that paint job aboard the Enterprise en route to war. And none of the pilots in 211 knew that they were going to be going to wake except for a selected, trusted few. So everybody was still in their flight gear. They were sailing aboard an Enterprise group commanded by Halsey, 
And Halsey was specifically instructed by Admiral Kimmel to go out and probe. And the Enterprise group was operating under battle orders. Battle order number one, very famous thing where stout hearts and steady nerves are needed. Or steady nerves and stout hearts, excuse me. And the aviators were, they knew war was coming. And they were out looking for the Japanese if they were out there. And they were out there to reinforce Wake. And of course, VMF 211 ended up fighting a rather incredible flight, fight until December 23rd, 1941. Yet another echo when they had to be lost to the Japanese and the Pacific fleet might have been able to have fought a battle, but it wouldn't have, it probably wouldn't have gone well for the Pacific fleet. <laughs> Uh, getting back to everything else, though, um, in looking at what's going on in the late part of 1941 in November, you have it very clear that they know war is coming, and Kimmel has his two aircraft carriers because he sortied the USS Lexington out on uh, December 5th with VMSB 231 with a group of SB2U Vindicator dive bombers, 18 of them. And that was supposed to be the, the air garrison of Midway. As, at this point, you only have PBYs, long range patrol aircraft operating out of these atolls. So you want to give them some protection. So you put fighters on wake, you put dive bombers on Midway. And so the Lexington carrier group led by Admiral Fitch was at sea. So by a fortuitous coincidence that was generated by the fact that they knew war was coming, it would have been a bad idea to have sorted the battle fleet uh, just in general, and Kimmel was dealing with operational and logistical issues as well because he only has so much oil in Hawaii, and that pipeline literally has to sail by tanker from the West Coast and has the fuel farms, and there's a lot of talk about if the Japanese had taken out the fuel farms, they would have probably crippled the American war effort, which I agree with, although their, their, their 16-inch converted bomb inventory was not apparently all that great. But the biggest thing happening with the Pacific fleet at this point in time is Kimmel doesn't have the oilers to support the battleships sortie. I mean, if you look at the subsequent history of the Pacific War, the Pacific fleet's operations were very, very hampered by the availability of oilers. And so what are you going to send out? You're a fleet commander. You have... X amount of resources, X amount of oil. And just as the Japanese had to calculate by abacus right down to the last liter of oil that they're consuming because they only have an 18 month reserve, you have a Pacific fleet that can only use so much oil. So, what vessels are you going to sortie at that given point in time? And the battleships are slow. The standard class battleships are 23 knot at its best, brand new with brand new boilers. So, by the time you're dealing with 20 plus year old capital ships, they're not going to be moving very fast. And you are you seeing Hawaii as the reserve rear area that you're operating the Pacific fleet from. So you need to be able to put yourself in a situation where your most valuable assets are not going to be caught in harbor. Your main fleet that consumes all your oil, it's a bad idea to sort you them because where are you going to bring them to? And you know, this whole war plan orange, which morphed into various iterations until it was rainbow five at the start of the war, but orange was the adversary, orange was close to Japan. You had this situation going on where you can only do so much. What are you going to support you? And the sad thing is history in a lot of ways has condemned Kimmel for being a battleship minded admiral. And yet it was Kimmel's disposition that kept his two most valuable units at sea out of Pearl Harbor. Now, is it a lucky coincidence? Yes, it is, because Enterprise was supposed to come back on the morning of December 7th. And in, in one of my posts regarding Halsey, as I tacked on an addendum to my Keto Butai series, you know, Halsey had a propensity for sailing into storms, as anybody that's a student of naval history knows. And what was keeping Halsey from Pearl, returning to Pearl on December 7th? Oh, he hit a bit of a storm, and he was having to... to deal with that and it was slowing him down so I have to say that out of all the storms that Admiral William Halsey ever experienced that storm probably did the most for our country in terms of the United States at least in terms of 
preserving the USS Enterprise and her role in the Civil War. Yeah, it's, I mean, you speaking of like the oil situation for the US fleet and, and um, all the related things surrounding that, I do find it fascinating that when you look at most maps of Pearl Harbor, uh, especially mm -hmm. obviously the anchorages, they'll show you Battleship Row. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, they might label USS Vestal more, I think, more because otherwise everyone gets confused what this ship in the middle of Battleship Row that is doesn't have a name <laughs> it is. The repair ship. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, they'll name California <laughs> that's sitting um, a little bit away, uh, a bit further further south. And very, very occasionally, you might get an arrow that points to where Enterprise was moored before and would be moored thereafter. Mm -hmm. And they always neglect this little ship that's sitting between California and Battleship Row, despite the fact that it's the Neosho, one of the very few fast fleet oilers that the US Pacific fleet has, obviously late to be sunk at Coral Sea. Everyone mm -hmm. ignores it, despite the fact that, you know, if... You didn't really need to kill West Virginia with that many torpedoes. It was already dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but one torpedo into Neosho, and that could have done that would have done far more damage to the US fleet's ability to operate in the months following Pearl Harbor than any number of torpedoes into the battleships did. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and beyond that, again, had they concentrated their efforts on taking out the fuel farms, which it's controversial as to whether the Kido Butai had the magazine capacity to, to launch a third strike. I, you know, I'm not an admiral, but I am somebody that has had a lifelong interest in, in what was going on. And I'm, I'm going to defer to the judgment of the admirals on the scene, looking at events from their perspective. And when you look at this, yeah, they show it in Tora Tora Tora, which is in my mind, the best Pearl Harbor film ever made, despite some of its inaccuracies. But they show the anger that Yamaguchi had over turning back. And, you know, there was a lot of talk of whether the Japanese could have invaded the islands. And what I will touch upon later in this special is that they did take one Hawaiian island for almost a week after Pearl Harbor. It's a hidden piece of history. But what went on on that day is had they gone and mounted a strike and taken out the fuel farms as well, they would have really seriously hurt the American war. effort, And nobody questions it. Whether or not they could have taken out the dry docks and docks around Pearl Harbor, another story. Um, and one of the things I want to touch upon too, just a brief aside onto the history of, of Pearl Harbor as a, as a base. Um, the Hawaiian Islands were taken over in the 1893 was the first attempted takeover where you had the USS Boston marching its crew, a naval landing party with a Gatling gun down with the support of the American minister to Hawaii, where the descendants of the missionaries who were the people that ran the Hawaiian Islands economy, even during the days of the Kingdom of Hawaii, because we were growing sugar back then. So the Kingdom of Hawaii was there. We do pronounce it with a V in the native speak. So the Kingdom of Hawaii was there and you had a situation where the United States intervened on behalf of rebels that were predominantly American. And the US minister had a United States Navy warship march a landing party, which confronted Queen Liliokalani, the last queen of the Kingdom of Hawaii. And she had to surrender to the overwhelming force of the United States government. And then you have a change of administration in Washington after that, where a Democrat takes over. And so it goes from Rutherford B. Hayes back to Grover Cleveland. And Grover Cleveland basically disavows the takeover of the people that were wanting to be annexed by the United States as an American colony. So you have these people end up basically telling the United States it has no right to interfere in the affairs of the Hawaiian Islands, and they formed the provisional government and the Republic of Hawaii, and they told Washington to go stuff itself. We're a sovereign nation. And then, of course, you have events further to the West in 1898 that lead to that lead to the United States becoming a colonial power by taking over the Philippines from Spain. And the Philippines are all the way across the Pacific. So where is a ship going to be able to coal and route? Well, in 1898, on July 4th, Hawaii is annexed as a, as a U.S. territory. And they started construction of the naval infrastructure in Pearl Harbor not too soon afterwards. Now, 
One of the incidents that happened is there's all sorts of superstition in Hawaiian lore, but this is actually documented. The Navy constructed a big dry dock in Pearl Harbor and the native population was rather upset that the Navy was going to do that because this dry dock was in a sacred spot to a, a shark dam. And they constructed this dry dock. And when they first tested it, the, the entire concrete coffered him and the dry dock collapsed. It was a huge disaster. It cost the Navy a ton of money back then. And then they finally were able to, fi to fix it and they pumped out the water from this dry dock. And when they did, they found the carcass of a giant shark at the bottom of this dry dock. This destroyed dry dock that they had gone through so much trouble for. And one of the accounts says, you could hear the I told you so is echoing throughout the Hawaiian Islands. <laughs> so you have a situation where Hawaii has been taken over by the United States. And one more thing I want to bring up on the takeover, because this was actually a, a paper I did in college, was there were two warships in Honolulu Harbor right before the initial takeover. The USS Boston, who was a protected cruiser of the AVCD class, the U.S. Navy's first steel warships. And you had His Imperial Japanese Majesty's protected cruiser, the Naniwa which was, of course, a British-made cruiser, one of the best. And what I did is I did a report comparing the technical specifications of the Boston versus the Naniwa. And guess who was commanding the Naniwa at that time in 1893? Take a wild guess. It couldn't be Yamamoto. It was not Yamamoto-san, oh, but it good. was. <laughs> it was Hayichi, Togo Haihichiro. Oh, so Togo-san, he was a cruiser commander in 1893. And yeah, I was, was going to say, yeah, Yama, Yamamoto was still a junior officer at Tsushima, so it would have been a bit too early for him. So now you have a situation where you have basically the most famous Japanese admiral up to the time when he was a relatively junior officer in charge of a cruiser. And he was facing a United States Navy vessel that was inferior in strength to him. And what he did is he stayed in the area, basically protecting Japanese interests and the interest of Japanese nationals in Hawaii at a very uncertain time when it was unclear as to whether or not uh, what the degree of American strength and whether the U.S. would be able to take over the Hawaiian Islands. And you have a lot of Japanese nationals working the plantations there. So naturally, the Japanese government had a vested interest in Hawaii. In Hawaii. And one of the really ironic things about this is for years into the 30s, and of course this stopped after World War II, but there was a brand of sake that was the most powerful, popular brand of sake in the Hawaiian Islands, and it was named after Admiral Togo. So there was an echo of even that initial intervention. And my conclusion in this was yes, based on hit rates at Tsushima compared to the hit rates of the United States Navy warships in the Spanish-American War, which is something on the order of less than 1%, the Japanese, under the command of Togo himself, aboard Naniwa, would have absolutely defeated the, the USS Boston. But that's a what if speculative in history, and the Japanese government had other interests closer to home. And of course, Togo would lead the uh, Naniwa in action in the Sino Japanese War of 1894 and start his march to fame. I suppose that there's, there's so many other things surrounding the Pearl Harbor attack that, that happen. Mm -hmm. Um, because as you mentioned, the, the carriers are out because um, Saratoga is going for refit, Lexington and Enterprise are ferrying aircraft to these outer defenses, Wake Island, Midway, etc., which have already got three inch guns <laughs> they requisitioned from earlier. Um, so the, the US is, mo is moving towards a war footing, but um, again, a re relatively less known element of the Pearl Harbor attacks, as I understand it, is that um, one of the Hawaiian islands was actually temporarily taken over by the Japanese Navy. Well, not necessarily a, intentionally. <laughs> that is correct. And that has been referred to as the Battle of Niki House. Now, you had a Japanese Zero fighter that was damaged, and it decided that it was going to go to the island of Niki House which was listed in Japanese charts as abandoned. And there was supposedly a submarine acting in a lifeguard capacity that was going to go ahead and take over that uh, or rescue any aviator that fell. So at any rate, 
this incident occurred on December 7th. And what was going on was an airman by the name of Shigenori Nishikaichi was flying a battle damage zero from the Hindu. And he crash landed in a Niihau field right near a man by the name of Havili Kaleohano was standing. And nobody on Niihau really knew that there was an attack on Pearl Harbor. So what occurred is that Kaleohano managed to relieve the pilot of his pistol and papers. And they, they basically gave him an impromptu luau because nobody knew that there was a war going on. But they also knew that something was going on because even though Niihau had no electricity or telephones, uh, they did hear on a battery powered radio a report about the attack on Pearl Harbor. So they, they basically confined the Japanese pilot and Unfortunately, there were a couple of sympathizers in the population, two, two Japanese Americans, uh, Japanese nationals, of course, but they were living on Niihau. And Niihau is an interesting place because it's a privately owned island. It's still to this day owned by the Robinson family. And even to go on, you have to pay hundreds of dollars and get special permission to go. They make the best lays in the Hawaiian Islands, but it is a place where even when I was flying between the islands, I never flew directly over Niihau because they were known to occasionally shoot at aircraft that got too close. So I stayed away out of respect as the following incident will show because what was going on was that the Japanese pilots on the Japanese pilot on Niihau, basically with the help of these two Japanese sympathizers escaped and he went to his aircraft and he salvaged a machine gun and he basically took over the island. And he was looking for the man who had originally captured him, Mr. Kaleo Hano. And Mr. Kaleo Hano got on a canoe and paddled across 17 miles of open ocean back to the island of Kauai to let the authorities know what was going on. And so the Japanese pilot, with the help of his accomplices, managed to capture several of the people. And finally, this went on for days. Finally, on November 13, 1941, Mr. Benny Kanahele, which is another big Hawaiian man, ended up confronting the pilot and his accomplices. And even though the pilot who had gotten his pistol back shot Mr. Kaleo Hano three times in the groin, stomach, and upper leg, or Mr. Kanahele, excuse me, Three times in this groin, stomach, and upper leg, Mr. Kanaheli was able to pick the Japanese pilot up, hurl him into a stone wall while his wife bashed him in the head with a rock, and he slit the, the pilot's throat with a hunting knife. And that's when the other accomplice turned a shotgun onto himself and committed suicide. So all the way until November 13, 1941, there was an echo in that Hawaiian island. And in other areas, you had other things going on as well. Um, keep in mind that December 7th is happening. And I'd like to go kind of chronological in this because there's so much going on. So December 7th happens in Hawaii. It's over by 9, 10 o'clock, right? But simultaneous to that, you have the Philippines. At 9, 10 o'clock Hawaiian time, the Philippines was just getting up. Everyone in the Philippines had gotten the message traffic that Pearl Harbor was happening. You now have Hap Arnold in charge of the Army Air Corps, whose main concentration of, of strike aircraft, the B-17 strength, is at Clark Field. Half of the 35 B-17s were at Clark. They were doing reconnaissance missions of the Japanese. The bombers were there. The fighters were there. There was plenty of advance warning. So as dawn broke in the Philippines, which is December 8th across the international date line, so dates can be confusing again, you have a situation where the Army Air Corps is warned that there's an attack. You have a situation where the Army Air Corps knows that Pearl Harbor has happened, knows that the Japanese are probably going to attack the Philippines because the Philippines are the front line, but instead the rear base gets attacked. The fighters scramble, but aircraft can only stay in the air for so long. You know, you have a limited fuel supply. And by early afternoon, the aircraft have to start landing again. 11, 12 o'clock, you're getting a dawn patrol scramble. You've been patrolling for hours. It's time to land. You have to fuel up. You have to, you have to rest. And that's what the pilots of the Far East Air Force did at Clark Field, and Iba Field, and Nichols Field, the main bases in the Philippines. 
most of the fighters were down. They had landed. And unfortunately for them, the Japanese strike force based in Formosa, led by the Tainan Kokutai, which was the most effective Japanese land-based unit, they were fogged in that morning. They could not take off. So they were stuck on the runway. They heard the news of Pearl Harbor. They shouted their bonsais. In the Philippines, the commander of the Far East Air Force actually wanted to hit the Japanese, but was denied permission by MacArthur's chief of staff. And he couldn't get permission. MacArthur actually kind of thought he could keep the Philippines neutral, even though Pearl Harbor had attacked Japan and the United States are at war. So there was no order to go after the Japanese airmen that were waiting on the ground to take off, fogged in. And so what ended up happening is the fog cleared, the delay in the Japanese takeoff occurred, and by a fortuitous coincidence for the Japanese side, they arrived in the Philippines just as the, uh, just as the American aircraft were running out of fuel and coming back into land. And that was a disaster, at least in the frontline forces of equal scale to Pearl Harbor. And it happened within eight hours of Pearl Harbor. So now you have a double series of events. You not only have the Pacific fleet gone by the end of the day, or at least in the beginning of the day, but by afternoon in Philippines time, you are now dealing with the loss of the Far East Air Force, half the B-17 strength, roughly a third of the T-40s. There's a great book called Doomed at the Start that details in events exactly what went down. And, and a surprising number of aircraft in the Philippines were cracked up by their own pilots because the airport pilots were not very experienced. And simultaneously to this, you have a situation where Enterprise is not that far from Pearl Harbor and Enterprise had launched her SVD Dauntlesses to return to Pearl Harbor that morning. And those aircraft were shot down by the Japanese en route. Several aircraft were lost, and now Enterprise knows what's going on. Enterprise is sending scout aircraft all, of, all to every point of the compass. They're trying to coordinate the activities of the surviving TBYs, but everyone in Hawaii is so much on edge that they think everything flying could be potentially Japanese. And there was a false report of a Japanese aircraft carrier task force later on in the day. So what ended up happening is that they launched a strike force looking for this phantom Japanese carrier, which of course wasn't there. And so the torpedo aircraft of Enterprise, Torpedo Squadron 6 actually had to do a night recovery, which they rarely did with fully armed TBD torpedo bombers at night. And there was a fighter section that ended up going to Pearl Harbor that night. It had to divert, led by Fritz Hebel. And out of six aircraft, only a few survivors because the, that aircraft, formation of six flew over Pearl Harbor and they did a normal traffic pattern doing a carrier break, which is a curbing turn. And when they were coming into land at NAS Fort Island, even though the Navy had made it very clear that these were American aircraft coming in, that these are our guys. The formation made a, a turn over battleship row and all those sailors who were traumatized by the attack that morning, every ship in Harbor opened up on those aircraft. And as they did, they shot down several of them. And one of the, one of the aviators has actually shot by rifle fire as he bailed out in his chute and he landed and had to swim. And unfortunately, he passed away. And so did several others. And so now you have a situation where one of the survivors lands on Fort Island in a wildcat. He's taxiing up and he's getting shot at as he's taxiing up. That particular aviator was named Jim Daniels. I had the honor of meeting him during the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor commemorations. And, you know, Jim Daniels had to experience all that. He said the one good thing for his day that day was he went to the bachelor officer's quarters in Ford Island and picked up the phone to try and call his wife and let her know that he was okay. And the phone actually worked. Phone line's still operating. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. So you have all kinds of things happening there. And this is where I want to make another kind of a jump because I do want to bring up the document that I want to be, briefly set this in motion going, dialing this back as far as my grandfather was, his testimony was in the Pearl Harbor Commission and he was a captain at the time of his testimony. Now, what he ended up doing was he ended up becoming 
the special assistant to General Delos Emmons, who took over from General Walter Short on December 17, 1941. So within 10 days, the army already said, okay, Short, you messed up, you're gone. And who did they appoint? General Delos Emmons was an army air corps aviator. So they put an aviator in charge of Hawaii rather than the infantry officer who thought that the local Japanese population was a threat. They're going to put in an air-minded individual to see to the defense of the islands. And all I know is that by May of 1942, my grandfather went from a captain in the United States Army to a lieutenant colonel. And by looking at the roster of headquarters Hawaiian Department, he was listed as special assistant to General Delos Emmons. That means that General Emmons would have been very much aware of my grandfather's profession, given that my grandfather was reactivated as a JAG officer, a legal officer. And so General Emmons, knowing that there's going to be an investigation, knowing that you know, Washington is going to want to get to the bottom of things, I suspect that General Emmons lawyered up and found the nearest con convenient lawyer who happened to be my grandfather and appointed him as special assistant and tasked my grandfather with gathering up as much information as he could in the archives of the Hawaiian Department in order to deal with the inevitable investigation that was to come. And that is, you know, it's literally a photo album and I'm finding things in it that I'm sharing here that really have changed history. I mean, the Marshall note has been published before, but there is one document in particular that I saw that even from the first time I saw it, I was amazed enough that I realized I needed to expose this document on a public forum in a way that would influence the history of the Pacific War. So without further ado, I'd like to pull up this document and let me find it. Hmm. Okay, so what we have is a series of message paraphrases. And I have several of them. And these are fascinating documents. They, they're in a piece of paper with bright red ink headed U.S. Naval Communication Service Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet. There is a, a, a little line for the classification level. There's the tone or word in bold caps, paraphrase. And then it says in a window, this is a paraphrase of a classified dispatch. Please return to coding officer for burning one of no further use. Now, I have several of these documents and they have been cited before, but I'm being extremely cautious in how I'm posting or sharing these documents because several of them have the original secret stamps on them. And by handling of documents, <laughs> unless it has a declassified stamp, I run the risk of even 80 year old information potentially being, I'm exposing American secrets. So I'm, I'm handling these documents extremely carefully because I don't want anything unfortunate to happen. But as, long, as long as they send a period intelligence officer after you, you should be okay. <laughs> well, what's fascinating about this document is that there is no classification stamp, none at all, but it's actually stuck to a page in the archive. And in the interest of not allowing this document to get damaged in any way, I am making sure that I am keeping it still stuck to the page it is stamped in or stuck to just because I don't want to risk any damage to this document. So I've taken a photo, which I sent to you earlier, and I'd like to read from this document because this was my, what is this document? So this is an undated document, but it's in the file and we can obviously interpolate when this document was sent. There is no there is no sender, there's no receiver. This just happens to be something from the Sync Pack, Commander in Chief Pacific Fleet. And it says the following Information has been received from the Governor General of the Netherlands East Indies, stating that a Japanese expeditionary force has arrived in the vicinity of Palau, parentheses Pelus. The Governor General, Netherlands East Indies, believes that if this force which is sufficiently strong to be a threat to the Netherlands, East Indies, or Portuguese Timor, makes any move below a line adjoining Davao, PI, Waigea, NEI, and the equator. He will consider such a move an act of aggression and under the circumstances will consider hostilities opened and will initiate appropriate measures. 
Now, when I first saw that document, that really floored me because I, I am a deep student of the Pacific War. I have a reference library that I volunteered at the Naval Aviation Museum for a while, and I have a bigger reference section than the Nav Air Museum of everything related to the Pacific War. And I have read these books, and I have never anywhere in all of my literature and all of my studies of the Pacific War in decades since I was a little kid fascinated by what the Dutch East Indies were. I've never seen any reference to this copy. It is clearly sta stating that if this Japanese force, which is going southbound, crosses a line from basically the Philippines, because Davao is in Mindanao, if it crosses this line from the Philippines to the equator, that's an act of war. And the Dutch are going to be the people who start World War II. Now, in going back to all of this, the reason I'm bringing up the Lani Kai, the reason I brought up all these things and the totality of everything is I wanted to set this in place and how this document, which actually has, you know, I, I love the classification stamp. Again, this is a paraphrase of a classified dispatch. Please return to coding officer for burning one of no further use. There's no classification stamp. There's nothing, but it's an official document. And when you look up information about a lot of the Pearl Harbor archives, you'll see that a lot of the information was burned. They were worried that Hawaii could have been potentially attacked. And you had message slips with instructions to burn them if they were of no further use. Now, here's my grandfather going through the archives of the Hawaiian department. And somehow he found this particular document that is clearly stating that if the Japanese invasion convoy crosses this line, the Dutch who have been shadowing this convoy, just as Admiral Hart was with his PBYs, the Dutch had a mixed air arm of PBYs and Dornier flying boats. So they, they had a good naval aviation shadowing capability. They knew that was go this was going on. And the governor general has his line of the sand and he is saying an act of war will exist. An act of aggression will happen and under the circumstances, he will open and initiate appropriate measures, which means that he's basically going to attack that fleet. I've never seen that before, have you? And that's been what really caused me to go ahead and you know, request for you to be on the channel is this is, has the potential to change the history of the Pacific War. And this is leading to a project of my own, which I'm doing a series of posts on my museum page. And I'm doing a show called History in Miniature, which is going to be up on YouTube soon. And I'm running everything through the Pensacola Aerospace Museum, which is a nonprofit entity I have formed, which is all about honoring the memory of all those who ever gave their lives to flight. I was a professional aviator for eight years, seven of which I spent instructing future naval aviators for the Navy's initial flight screening program. I have just shy of 5,000 hours of flight time. I've always loved flying. I've always loved the history of flying. And when I see something like this, I decided that along with another incident that occurred where a former student of mine who, as we record on the 6th, the post on the 7th, he passed away on December 6th, 2018. His name was Captain Jamar Rezillard, United States Marine Corps. And he was operating out of Iwakuni, Japan, off of Kyushu. And he was flying an F-18D two-seat strike hornet. And he was mid-air refueling with a KC-130 when... Unfortunately, they had a mid-air collision, and he was killed in that incident along with the crew of the C-130, all five of the C-130 and Captain Resillard. And on the day that William Shatner went up on October 13th, I saw on my Facebook news feed a, a picture floating in space, and it happened to be my former student, which as a lifetime aviation enthusiast, that kind of blew my mind. And I... I had that, I had grandpa's archive, and I decided I was gonna build a museum to act as an umbrella for both, both to properly honor the loss of a man who served our country, whose lifelong dream was to be a fighter pilot for the Marine Corps after seeing Independence Day. And then this gets a little bit stranger because I had reached out to Jamar's mother, and the day I reached out to her to let her know that I was fine, I was in the process of starting my own museum and I wanted to honor Jamar, she tells me it's her birthday. So when, as I'm putting out paperwork for the uh, museum to be a nonprofit, we end up in a situation where I needed two more board of director members. And I went ahead and reached out to Mrs. Resillard and she agreed. So she's now part of our 
board of directors and another friend from a long time ago who happens to be a PhD from uh, Harvard of all places in Germanic history and literature. She has agreed to be our historian, our resident PhD. So we are in the process of, we're waiting on the paperwork to come through from the state of Florida to get our nonprofit status, we'll be submitting. And we will be building a physical facility, but our primary goal in all of this is we're going to be making a series of YouTube short documentaries. And we are going to be basically populating a virtual, a virtual exhibit where we're using miniatures and the YouTube channel is called History and Miniature. Uh, our first episode will be up soon. There's been some technical issues. And then we will also be populating our exhibit which will consist of a series of miniatures photographed in front of dynamic backdrops illustrating famous incidents in history, not just limited to aviation, maritime as well. We'll have obviously have links to all of this down um, in the yes. uh, down below in the video description. Mm -hmm. So that's my activity. So what I've been doing right now is I, as I'm waiting for my dot org to be uh, yeah, I don't. I don't feel comfortable having a dot org unless my I am a legit nonprofit. But I've established a Facebook page, and I've been doing a lot of writing on that and posting. And it's interesting because some of the pieces have actually gone semi-viral. Um, and I invite everyone to check it out on Facebook, and whether or not you're a Facebook person or not. But that's where we have a lot of things. It's at uh, Facebook.com/slash Pensacolero. So basically, Pensacola. A E R O with keeping the A in Pensacola and just E R O. So Eero after the word Pensacola. Mm -hmm. And in that, I've been doing a series on both the Keto Butai and yeah, Admiral Halsey and the Enterprise Group. Did a piece on Japanese naval aviators and American naval aviators. And what I'm trying to do with this particular project is I'm trying to make a format where I'm not, you know. My goal is to publish the history of the Dutch East Indies campaign using this particular, what I call the Stachur warning, because the governor general of the Indies was Stachur, and basically covering a forgotten chapter in history, which some things have been written about, but a detailed analysis with this document as its starting point. And it's a matter of, I'm actually going to be continuing to publish this information on, uh, on our venues, you know, the Facebook site, eventually we're going to have our Twitter and Instagram and everything else up, our website. But we're looking at publishing in a serialized series of installments, the history of the Dutch East Indies campaign, as we're already doing with the Kido Butai, which is a series that will continue. Greg Boington, whose birthday was over the weekend, which is another series that we are going to be doing in multiple installments. And we want to continue this all the way to mark all the other 80th anniversaries of the Pacific War, because 80 years is an interesting distinction. We're really at the point in time where there are not that many Pearl Harbor survivors left with us. And when you lose that human link in the chain of history, all you can do is take the material that they've gathered throughout their lives, the, the lifetime of material that they have, and commemorate them as best we can, which is also part of the, the mission set of our Pensacola Aerospace Museum to honor the legacy of all those who ever gave their lives to flight. That includes people on the ground that were bombed by aircraft. And this is an incredibly important thing to remember. Pearl Harbor, as the anniversary suggests, was 80 years ago. The survivors of that day, assuming they were US service personnel at the time, are in their very late 90s, if not over 100. They've done incredibly well to get this far. But as an element of living history, Pearl Harbor is unfortunately soon to pass into the realms of just plain old history. So maintaining their accounts, especially when, you know, perhaps those people aren't around anymore and what they've left behind in terms of papers and such, they need to be preserved before they're lost forever. So hopefully this video has given you a bit more information around the context of Pearl Harbor, the history, why it happened, what was going on around the event, and a little bit of insight about what it was like to be there, at least for one person caught up in all the events. Thank you very much for watching. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.